Um, it is November 27th, 2011. Our message this morning is yours for theirs. Yours for theirs. I want to start in a little bit of an unusual place. Of course, it's normal for me to start in Genesis, but maybe this part of the message does not as immediately tie in. It's just something that sparked in my spirit that uh, I want to make sure I'm obedient to. So be in the 45th chapter of Genesis, let us pick up in the 27th verse. But when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. I just wanted to share this verse with you and talk to you about it for a minute. minute. Many times in the body of Christ, when we look around, what we are seeing is we are seeing people that were born with great vision. They put a, a coat of many colors upon their great vision. They had high hopes for it. They bounced it on their knee. They encouraged it. They fanned it into flame. And then somewhere along the way, the train got off the rails. There was a crash of some kind. And they feel like Joseph died. You don't know what I'm talking about. The person we're reading about here is Jacob. He had a son that was very favored named Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery by his very own brothers. And when this happened, Joseph kept say, or Jacob kept saying things like, I am bereaved. He was broken hearted. As I travel around and I speak with Christians, I find out that people were born again with great hopes, great expectations. You wanted to do something for the Lord. And somewhere along the way, you feel like you zigged when you should have zagged or maybe somebody else did that to you and your dream just kind of went up in smoke and you have settled for something that resembles more just existing now if you don't think that uh, that that word applies i assure you for someone in here it does or the lord would not do this to me this way when jacob saw joseph again realized decades have gone by something revived in him church i am encouraging you to dig deep to remember what the lord has shown you in your life to begin to envision it again because something will revive in you. God did not call a single person in this fellowship or any other to simply sit on a bench while the kingdom moves forward. In fact, Luke 16, 16 says that forceful men force their way into the kingdom. Matthew says it a little differently. They lay hold of the kingdom. This means you force aside discouragement. You force aside everything else. And let's be honest, maybe you did zig when you should have zagged, but we serve a God who has been working with humanity for 6,000 years. He can certainly work with you. Something revived in this old man. You, you get the, the feeling that something kind of bubbled up in him. Look at 46 verse 30. Israel said to Joseph, Now I am ready to die since I have seen myself for myself that you are still alive. Jacob gets into Egypt and he sees his son Joseph and he says, oh, man, this is, this is great. I could go ahead and die right now. As if the whole goal was just to know that his son was alive again. Do you know how many more years he lived after this? 17. He wasn't ready to die. He was 130 when this happened. He didn't die until he was 147. And if you follow the story forward, by the time we get to Genesis 48, he is seeing his grandchildren in Egypt. I want to tell you, saints, that this morning the word that came to my heart during worship was it's not too late. I don't know what's happened in your life. I don't know some of you well enough to know, but it is not too late. And the devil is a master at covering you in despair. We're taught, Psalm 4 teaches us, to drive out despair and replace it with the oil of joy. If your enemy is there mocking you in your ear, you can agree with him. Tell him that all those things are true and many more things that he has failed to list and yet your God is able to deliver you. Amen. This is the hope of the gospel. Amen? Amen? All right, let's get into our word. Turn to Matthew 14. I just wanted to tell you that new life should be coming to us no matter what your circumstances are. This ministry would never get off the ground if we didn't fight through discouragement. Three times in my life I have laid my whole life aside the place that I live, the place that I worship, the place that I pastored, the place that I worked, and I have gone somewhere new and started again. And friends, you are the product of it now. If you spend your whole life looking backwards, regretting what 
you did not do, what you should have done, what could have been said, what wasn't said, all of those things, then you are dying a little bit every day. And you were called to live, to follow the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. You were called to an abundant life that he leads us into. Be careful that we don't look back to the Egypt of selfishness. This word is rolling in my spirit, and I can't help it. I would like to preach on something else, but I'm concerned that somewhere along the way, you may have gotten distracted. Your eyes may be upon your failure or the failure of others. How many ugly things happened to put Joseph in Egypt? But he said God did it. You know why God did it? Genesis 47, 28 says, He did it to save your lives. God allowed difficult things to happen to Joseph, even his brothers to sin, to save lives. Did he save just a few lives? He became, the Egyptians called him Zathanath Panea. In the Egyptian tongue, it means savior of the world. He's a type of Jesus. So difficult things have happened in your life. Maybe more than should have. Maybe some were done to you in the church. I mean, that's the devil's favorite tool is to wound you inside of the hospital that is supposed to heal you. We preach Wednesday about a whatever attitude. Sometimes if you know God's blessings on your life, people can stop up your wells. They can stomp on your dreams. They can throw you in a hole. But you'll go from the hole to Potiphar's house, from Potiphar's house to a prison, and from the prison to a palace. The call of God cannot be stopped. One time my feelings were really hurt. Does that surprise you? One time? One time? Don't you love how we say those things? We confess our weaknesses and hide our sins, and we, we say, one time this happened. And one of the things we do in marriage counseling is we cause people to be introspective. We force it. We don't allow it to be any other way. So we pick Bible stories that make you name negative traits in your own life. And it's hilarious, David, to watch people do this. Well, sometimes, you know, kind of, if, if I'm in the right situation, and, and I mean the temperature's a certain degree, and the moon and, and the stars have aligned, I can be angry. Like, really? It takes all that, huh? We have a hard time embracing the fact that we are weak and flawed, but his power comes in and makes us different. I just wanted to tell you, it is not too late, friends. No matter what it is, you can make your new start right now. Get your eyes out of the rearview mirror. Start looking for what God put ahead and run with purpose to the distance. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Good, then I can preach about something else because you've already got that, right? Amen. Or should we stick on that subject? Natalie, what do you think? It's hard to know. She's got a mouthful of gum. All right, y'all in Matthew 14? Of course you're not. I didn't tell you. Did I tell you to get there? Yeah. See, y'all going to have to help me this morning. Half the church is gone. That means this half is going to have to make up for it. Right? But Clementina's here. That's all that matters. Right, girl? Okay. So in Matthew 14, I wanted to show something that would be devastating. I mean, can you imagine? Anybody in here got a cousin? Raise your hand if you have a cousin. Okay, most of you have cousins. In Matthew 14, let us pick up then in verse 11. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came in and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. In case you're missing the scene, Jesus' cousin, a, a mighty, mighty prophet of God, who has been prophesying about sin and calling the people to repentance and warning people that fruit had to accompany their repentance or it was not repentance at all, has just been beheaded for the pleasure of a little girl, her wicked mother, and their uh, strange sexual relationship with a would-be king. Yeah, you can't make this stuff up. It's, it's like uh, days of our lives on steroids. And it's Jesus' blood relative. He probably grew up hearing stories about each other. The disciples have just come and said, we saw his headless body and we had to bury him. What would you feel like if that was somebody sitting to your left or to your right? Can you say that you might want to shed tears? Would it be difficult? Judah, would that be hard? What if they came in and said that Rebecca, your cousin, had been killed? How would you feel? Be pretty upset. Is there anybody in here that thinks that you would not be upset at that? Listen to what Jesus does. It's a very, very normal thing. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by a boat privately to a solitary place. 
Does that strike you as odd that the king of the universe is here to minister to mankind, but he gets terrible news and he wants to get alone to pray? Has nobody ever been there? Has the kingdom not dealt you such a blow at a time that you just needed to get alone with God? Like you're sure you still loved him, you just didn't know if you loved the people that are called by his name? I was in Lafayette, Louisiana during a time period in my life. I was looking through the ear hole of the helmet of salvation. I parked next to a swimming pool in the middle of the day when I was supposed to be working. I was sitting there praying by myself, all alone. Lord, I don't know what's going on with my life right now. I feel a little bit like Jonah, but I didn't mean to run from your presence. I was trying to do your will. I don't know what's wrong with all of the people that call themselves by your name. Is it me? Is it them? I mean, literally, I just didn't know. While I was sitting there, a woman walked up to me. I thought I was alone. She said, sir, can I talk to you? Now, I'm a pastor. What am I supposed to say? Somebody tell me. Come on, y'all got pastors. What are you supposed to say? Sure, I'd love to. I said, lady, why don't you pick somebody else? Wouldn't that discourage you? Right? No warm, friendly handshake. I was hurt. I don't want to talk to anybody. I want to talk to God. I was mad she was interrupting. I said, lady, why don't you pick somebody else? She said, I feel like I need to talk to you. I had just told God I felt like Jonah, and now he's chasing me down. <laughs> she was at a Bible study later that night at our house. In two years, we had a church growing out of our house. And it started because I was hurt sitting by a swimming pool, not knowing what to do, but the call of God tracked me down. About the time I got comfortable there, our kids were doing well in school. I was excelling in work. The church was starting to grow. Everybody I knew that had been Catholic was now suddenly spirit-filled. Hallelujah. Yeah, amen. <laughs> the Lord began to deal with us and tell us to move. That was crushing. That was fantastic. Now we see the results of it. It was crushing. Like, you're kidding. I just got used to this place. What are we going to tell our families? You know, I had just, got, just won the fight with my wife to not go shop an hour away in another city that we had come from. And now we have to move five hours away, four hours away. What happens, though, if we're not obedient? Jesus has got a loan here in, in Matthew 14. He's got a loan because he's hurt. It's not sin to be hurt, friends. It's sin to stay that way. Amen. It's sin to let it define your life. It is not sin to have been struck in the face figuratively or spiritually, and he just got walloped. And he withdraws to a solitary place. And what happens? When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. The heart of the gospel is not that you tend to your own needs. It's not that you don't have them. The Father knows that you do. But the heart of the gospel is that you deny yourself for someone else. What did Jesus want to do? He wanted to go crawl up on a mountainside by himself and just talk with the Father. But ministry tracked him down. People surrounded him, and they had great need. And because he was righteous, he began to care more about them than himself. And compassion rose up. Friends, who has God put in your life today that has a great need? And if we're sitting around sucking our own thumbs, whining about our own lives, you are missing out on what God called you to do for them. Jesus went off hurt, and he ends up healing people. You get the impression a whole bunch of people. What happens next in the story? I mean, he's on vacation, you know. Can't, can't you just turn off your cell phone for a while? I've heard that one in my family before. <laughs> As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place. Well, yeah, it is. I was trying to get away from you and everyone else. And it's already getting late. Send the crowds away. It's an interesting thing that we do here. When we perceive rightly that the time is late, we incorrectly perceive what to do. The time is late, let's give up. There's only so many hours in a day to work, and there's only an hour left, we can't get it done. Let's just pack up, we'll call it a day, you know? 
This was not Jesus' attitude, though. He hears that it's already late and that they're in a remote place. For him, the time becomes short to do something. I want to ask you, is it late in your life? Have you wasted too much time already? Do we give up now and just say, oh, well, you know, we'd go join the Hindus. Maybe it'll be better in the next life. Or do you realize time is short? You only have a little time to act. Take advantage of it now. Friends, I might not have got it right yesterday, but that was yesterday. I'm standing in today. I can choose right now to get it right. This is the heart of the gospel that a man's way is not so predetermined that if you get off track, you can't turn around. It's never too late to turn around. We have a GPS system in our truck. It's so far never right. It spends its entire life recalculating and if you followed it, you would be just driving in circles. This is people's God's positioning system in their life. They're not listening rightly. I say, oh, well, we're praying about that. We're praying about that. We're praying about that. The reality is you're just recalculating and going in circles. You pray for the will of God. I want to encourage you with what that German evangelist said. You pray for the will of God. I will run you over from behind, he said, while I do the will of God. Sometimes we need to pick a direction and just move in it. You can preach yourself out of a hole, friends. You can live the kingdom so that what is behind you has become behind you. And we do not have to look back. I don't like to even visit Egypt, friends. Yes. Not in my thoughts. Not in, There is no highlight reel from how good the leeks and the onions were. The kingdom is ever before me. It's hanging out there and I am chasing after it. And it is on the move, so I must be too. I don't want my life to be defined by regret. What should have happened? What could have happened? <clears throat> How about what can happen? How about what lies ahead? How do you, have you ever woke up and you just didn't feel good? Somebody get born again, though, it'll change your attitude, won't it? It's like Jacob's spirit reviving inside him. He was having a terrible decade. You follow me? Yes. A terrible decade, kind of like the 70s, Mom. A terrible <laughs> decade. <laughs> the early part of the 80s weren't much better, but, you know, what was up with those pants? You know? People are going to ask the same thing in another 10 years about this one, though. Skinny jeans. Who in love was anybody thinking? <laughs> he was having a terrible decade, but he saw his son, who was never really dead. He just gave him up for dead. And all of a sudden, something revived in him. The man lived 17 more years and saw his grandkids and blessed every one of them. I bet there's more spiritual life ahead for you, Amen. if you are willing. Yeah. We don't typically meet preach your champion messages here. Our goal is not to make everybody feel like it's Friday. I could care less whether we're happy, prosperous, wealthy, fat, all of those things that the American church runs after. I think it's pagan idolatry. But I feel the Spirit of God inside me encouraging me to encourage you. There is plenty left ahead. Put your hands on the plow. Quit looking backwards. Work. Amazing things happen in your life when you see others changed by the power of God. I can be having a terrible day. Let somebody get filled with the Holy Ghost and all of a sudden I'm having a good week. You understand? These are game changers, friends. I can stand up here and look and see the people that are not here. The ones that have been saved in the last month that are not here. And we could focus on that. And we could, Before long we're walking about this high and we might as well just lay down and die. Or I could look out and see the lives that have been saved that are here. Do you remember when Cody was a 16-year-old boy? Yes. you remember what Brandon was like when he still had that poodle haircut? Yes. Look what God is doing. Yes. you remember the first time Larissa walked through the door? Yes. See, this is the kingdom, and it is ever moving forward, and it is very much a war. It will leave its marks on you. But there's a healing God. He will compel you. He will grab you by the hand and say, come on, you can do this. You leave Egypt dressed for battle. But we encounter only the enemies that he put on the route for us. And it's to encourage us.
as evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. See, this defeated attitude is always about what they should do for themselves. <laughs> Friends, if the world could do for themselves, they wouldn't be lost. And neither would you have been. The gospel is all about what you cannot do for yourself. The gospel is an innate understanding of just how impossible it is for you to do it yourself. And mercy is when he comes in and makes up the difference for you. We've changed mercy into gra and grace into some kind of license for a morality. The reality is it's for the one that is trying with all their heart to dunk the basketball but can only touch the bottom of the net and he makes up that extra foot. It's not for the one that's laying down on the bench somewhere. Then, oh, well, you know, by grace, we outscored the other team. Liar, you're not even on the team. You're a poser. Do people still use that word, man? You're a poser. <laughs> I don't know. I probably will never be hip. I hope y'all are not looking for a hip pastor. It's not going to happen. Yeah, amen. <laughs> The Bible says, woe unto you when all men speak well of you. I don't want to be chic. I don't want to know what's going on with all the latest everything. I, I listened to Paul Washer today, who I wouldn't listen to for years because he was Baptist. Then I found out he's no more an ordinary Baptist than I was. He said, it's time, generation, to stop being a sissy and hiding on Facebook and stand up and be a man and do the things that Jesus did. I thought, man, that'll preach. So you'll probably hear that next week. <laughs> Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Church, I would like to tell you, you were here to provide something for the world around you. This goes against our capitalist mentality. We have what we have because we earned it. We have what we have because by the strength of our own arm, buddy, we provided it. We work harder. We say more. We did without. All those things are admirable, but your life is not your own. It belongs to the king. And the things that God has given you, he has given you for one purpose, to be a steward of. He has caused you to be a steward of his goodness and to dispense it as he says. You don't own it. And if you own it, God doesn't. And if you are a rival owner to God, then you're an idol in your own life. Nothing that you have belongs to you. We say, oh, I give God this. Like in the church, places where they pass a plate, and we gave that up a long time ago. We put a box in the back of the room. But in places they do that, they say, you need to give God your 10%. No, friends, God gave me all of it. The 10% belonged to him as much as the other 90% did. My job is to be obedient to anything that he has told me. Yeah. I'm not nearly as concerned with your 10% as with your life. I don't think that you were supposed to come and sit in here in a spiritual safety deposit box and support me. I don't think you're supposed to do that. I think you're supposed to be radical, life-changing people with something to give to the world. Am I in full-time ministry, David? Is that how that works? <laughs> If I'm in full-time ministry, what kind of ministry are you in? Half-time? Part-time? Quarter-time? Where did the radical call of God go out and say, if any of you would like to serve me an hour a week? Anybody? Five hours a week? Ten hours? He either owns our lives or he doesn't. The disciples look and they go, we don't have anything. Jesus said, give them something to eat. We have here only five fish of bread. Five loaves and two fish, they answered. You know the rest of the story. I don't have to read it to you. They had brought what they had and God multiplied it. Maybe Tyrell doesn't have everything that he needs to meet the needs of the world. But when he contributes what he has in the area God has put him, God will multiply it. We serve the only God in the world that will let you pick up more than you started with after you fed 5,000 more than you intended to. This is not prosperity gospel I'm preaching, friends. I'm talking about your life. Maybe you gave up a nice home. Maybe you gave up a nice job. You set out to a new place. Give Him what you do have. Give it to Him now. All of it. 100% of it. Stop looking backwards. And what will He do? He will so multiply you that you'll be like Israel. They covered the earth. They started in a little family. Was it a good thing that they got to Egypt originally? Not at all. 
Slavery brought them there. Sin brought them there. Famine brought them there. But they became a nation in the waiting right there. <coughs> you know, sometimes we need to look past our present circumstances. We've been tricked into thinking the gospel is all about where you're happiest. You're not a good judge of where you're happiest. How many of you have said, when I get to that, then I will be happy? Uh, when, when we do this, then I'll be happy. And how many of those have come and gone? You know where happiness is? Knowing that you're in the center of God's will. It doesn't matter whether it's good, bad, or ugly. If you're in the center of God's will, you're right where you're supposed to be, and you can smile in the face of the enemy. That's the gospel, friends. That's what the kingdom's about. I'm going to assure you that anybody who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If you're not being persecuted, step up your game. Get louder. Get bolder. Go embrace the world more. If you are not being persecuted, then you're not dangerous enough to the enemy to cause him to notice you. How can I say something like that? Paul said it to Timothy as plain as day. We just don't preach on it or focus on it because... You know, it makes us feel bad, and church is about making us feel good. I don't think so. I think church is about getting your life right with God, joining in the throng of others who are doing the same, running the race together, spurring one another on. We're here to make a difference, not just make friends. In Matthew 14, Jesus just wanted to go get alone with the Father. But the Father had work for him to do even in his remote, private, solitary place. Isn't that an amazing thing? What would happen if we dropped all the walls? If there was no line between clergy and laity? And you all really were the kingdom of priests that we talk about being. And there was no division between you and the other people. And they got to come into your private, remote, solitary lives. We connect to 1,100 people on Facebook, but we don't have five friends who come and eat in our house. How does that work? That's not a puppy. Yeah, Y'all see the commercial? Yeah. This is not how that's supposed to be, guys. Jesus, in that place, was followed by all of the people, and he met their needs right there. Let's do this. Let's go to another scripture. Is that okay? Yes. yes. How about you turn to John 16? In John 16, how about verse 12? I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. <laughs> Must have been 12 o'clock. The deacons were tapping their watch at Jesus. <laughs> but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. If we can get our eyes off of what's been going on in our past, if we can get our eyes off of our circumstance right now, then the Holy Spirit can begin to show us what he has that is ahead for us. He can take of the glory that God laid out in advance for you. See, Ephesians 2 says that he prepared good work in advance for you to do. That's Ephesians 2 right after the 10th verse. He prepared it in advance. The Holy Spirit will reach into that, that plan for Irma's life, and he will begin to lay it out there, and he will give you something to run for. You know, people that are about to commit suicide, do it almost always because they have no purpose. There was a man gave a testimony in my house just the other night. He was on his way to go kill himself, and he ran into a pretty girl. Right? Now, a pretty girl might not be uh, a saving grace, but the fact that he ran into her gave him something else to think about and do. And he was alive two years later to come into my house. You go to a nursing home, you want to extend somebody's life? Give them a puppy. Give them something to take care of. Some purpose. That might seem trite. It might seem trivial. But you were here to do something. And the Holy Spirit will show you that. He will take from what is Jesus 
and bring that right into your life and set it before you so that you can run with purpose. Not an aimless person just beating the air trying to survive. Turn with me to Acts 16. Where are the rest of you? Elizabeth made it there. There. Acts 16, verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia in Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Can you imagine that you're close enough to the Lord that he says, mm, not there, <laughs> not there, not there, there. There was a time in Paul's life where the Holy Spirit couldn't just say, Paul, don't want you to preach in Asia. He was kicking against the goads. Do y'all remember that? Yeah. It's on his road to Damascus that uh, he has this vision. He's pressed to the ground, gets scales on his eyes, and he says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He goes on to say, you are kicking against the King James words pricks, but it, it means a sharp instrument sticking you. For us, we're not to be led like dumb cattle. We're not supposed to have to be poked with painful experiences. In fact, the Holy Spirit will lead us rather than drive us. And the Holy Spirit is saying, no, not here, Paul. Not, not in the province of Asia. But where is he going to go next? When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. You hear sometimes it's called the Holy Spirit, sometimes the Spirit of Jesus. Those things are interchangeable. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over here to Macedonia and help us. This is an interesting thing. Y'all don't get fascinated with this uh, pad here. We're learning to use it. He said, one man from Macedonia, which we're going to abbreviate here, said, come help us. How about that? When we look at the one Macedonian man that we see that Paul saw in a dream, he said, come help us. Now, maybe the most logical conclusion when you read that is, come help us, all of Macedonia. But we really don't know because we don't know what Paul saw. We do know that Luke, who was with him, Timothy, who was with him, Silas, who was with him, is so compelled by the dream that Paul had, they said, we have concluded that God called us to go with you. You can read that in the 10th verse. They said that God had called all of them to go. So let's just imagine I walked back there to Renan and Andrew and, and Brenda and I said, hey, I had a dream of a man in Yugoslavia. Oh, good. God's called us all to go. Probably not happening, huh? I suspect there was a little more to the dream than that. I suspect that what we're getting from Luke is a highlight. One of the reasons that I suspect that is they get to Macedonia. You can flip through this chapter. And while in Macedonia, they meet somebody. Her name is Lydia. She's a dyer of purple cloth, right? They meet her out by a river at a place, uh, 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 at a prayer time. But Lydia's not a Macedonian man, is she? Can you skim down in your book and see who's the next person they met? A demon-possessed girl. And what does she say? Oh, these men are servants of the Most High God showing you the way to be saved. Paul is troubled by that. This is not the vision I saw at all. In fact, that seems to be a demon. Finally cast it out. I'm not saying there are confusing times between the culmination of your vision and the origination of it. Think about old man Jacob and what he went through with Joseph. He knew that Joseph was different. He gave him a coat of many colors. He began to exalt him among his brothers. But Joseph had to die in Jacob's heart for it to come about that he was the king of the world. Think in Joseph's life. Joseph's the one that received the vision. He saw the sun, moon, and stars bowing down to him. He saw 11 sheaves of wheat, or barley rather, bowing down to him. But he went through an awful dying time before that happened, didn't he? This is what trust is, friends. You know, George Michael sang a song, You've Got to Have Faith, but he must have been singing about something else. His faith seems to be in abnormal relationships with other men and cocaine. But the faith in the Bible, the word that in Greek is pistis and in Hebrew is immuna, means to cling to and trust. It's not like a football that you have or don't have. 
You, you, don't, you don't say, here, David, here is my faith. Would you like to see it? Would you like to hold it? Would you like to pet it? Faith is not a noun. Faith is a verb. And it is something that you are trusting, displaying in. To really trust in a vision that God gave you, He needed to give it to you, number one. And then, if all the power of hell is unleashed against it, we trust that it will come about. This is how Abraham in the fourth chapter of Romans, somewhere around the 13th verse, says he could face the fact that his wife's body was as good as dead, yet not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. It's also how he could take a son up on a mountain, the son who's supposed to inherit all things, and be willing to kill him because Hebrews 11 says he reasoned that God was able to raise him from the dead. I want to say, people of the faith of Abraham, your vision may seem like it's foundering. It may not be coming about as quickly as you would like. Maybe you've encountered some confusing times. Maybe even like Paul with this strange girl here. They say all of the right things, but act more like devils. Come on, am I the only one that has been seeing sheep that have canine teeth? Carnivorous sheep. It shouldn't happen. But every Sunday, right after the message, there are more pastors eating than fried chicken. Whoever sang the solo becomes the point of the jokes. Yeah, the appetizer. This woman was saying all of the right things, but she was motivated by demons. So where does Paul end up? What is the culmination of Paul's vision here? Well, looks like in verse 25, he's in jail. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all of the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. Now, I'm just, maybe I'm a pragmatist. I, I mean, I don't know what to say. If you're in jail, what are you probably praying about? Yeah. That's what I'd be praying about. <coughs> I don't want to admit to any personal experience in that arena. <laughs> Suzanne had to come get me from Port Allen, David. I wouldn't call my own parents. I was scared to death. She came and got me from Port Allen. I, was, I didn't tell her, but I was driving down Highway 1 with a shotgun, looking backwards, and I glanced up. And by some strange act of momentum, the car in front of me was completely stopped on a bridge. So I totaled the truck that me and their daughter was riding in, threw a gun over the bridge so that the policeman didn't uh, catch me with it, and then went to jail with no front teeth and all cut up. In that situation, you don't call Gary Kinchin. <laughs> my stepfather. He's my father, but that's why our last name is there. So I thought about it, and I thought of the most merciful people I knew in my life, who was least likely to jump on me and beat me up, and I called Suzanne. <laughs> now I have no idea why I told that story, and I'm so, oh, I remember now. While I was in that situation, sitting there with zip ties on my hands, you know, because uh, they want you to stay warm. <laughs> I was praying. And it was to get out of that situation, to undo it. Now these people are praying and they're singing hymns. The prison doors have flown open. The chains have fallen off. And what do they do? They don't go anywhere. Wouldn't you say, whoa, prayer of the answer, bye, see y'all. <laughs> or, you know, bad to be you. <laughs> right, would you? Yeah. Come on, nobody in here will admit to that. Andrew, wouldn't you do that? Yeah. Why didn't he? Do you think that during their time in the prison, they might have seen somebody who was a man of Macedonia that Paul said, that guy looks familiar. It's almost like, like we have a connection of some kind. Judge, I don't know why I feel like I know you, but maybe, maybe God put us in each other's life for a divine appointment. Amen. Because what we know happens next is there is a jailer who wants to kill himself. Right? All the prison doors are open, but Paul and Silas didn't go anywhere. I, I would think they would have left, but they didn't. The jailer woke up, verse 27, and when he saw the prison doors open, he threw 
he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Come on, his lights went on in more ways than one. Huh? You ever been there when ding, ding, lights came on? Yeah. I remember. I was sitting in a, I was sitting in a church, and uh, a man was preaching. He was preaching on Matthew 7, 21. He said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter my kingdom, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. I had heard it. I could probably quote it. I had a textbook sitting next to me that was a Bible. It meant really nothing to me. And ding, 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 the light went on. You're not doing the will of the Father. You say, Lord, Lord, fine, but there is no way to twist your life into something that is doing the will of the Father. Oh, man. I wanted to draw my sword and cut my own head off. I didn't have a sword. I wasn't sure I wanted to be saved. That wasn't the point. I just felt guilty. Really, really guilty. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Listen to this reply very carefully. They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. We had one Macedonian man in the vision, but he said, come and help us. I'm suspecting that Paul saw a wife and saw children. And Luke only wrote down the man because how else could Paul know that his whole family was going to get saved? I believe in a spirit-led evangelism. I don't particularly like that Kirk Cameron and that little Australian guy trap people in elevators. I don't think it's cool. I don't think anything comes from winning an argument. But I am all about getting on my face saying, Lord, my day's not going too well. Truthfully, Lord, this week had not gone like I would want it to. Would you show me something I can do for you? Is there somebody out there that you care for that I could go make contact with? Because when I do, they will have a sense of purpose and I will have a sense of purpose and your kingdom can advance as new things are set in motion. That's what the kind of evangelism that I look for. You know, almost everybody in this church can be traced back to four or five meetings like that. Matthew Pirro and I pulled over on the side of a road. We were sitting in front of a coffee house. He had to take a work call. When the work call was over, we prayed, Lord, where are all of the people you called us to Sugarland to meet? Where are the crazy young men that will go face down giants for you? We, you sent us people, but they all got 35 kids apiece, and none of them are interested in leaving the house right now. Where are the fireballs? I didn't know it was our job to make them yet. I walked into a coffee shop, saw a young man with tattoos on his wrist. Oh, it's easy in the church world to go, tattoos. And what was he doing tattooing Hebrew on himself? Of course, the other way to look at it is this young man thought enough about the Bible and was interested enough in the language Hebrew to mark his skin with it permanently. So I started a conversation with him. About a third of the church comes from that conversation. There's a young lady in Lafayette. She said, y'all aren't those kind of people that speak in tongues, are you? I said, boy, aren't you a bold little thing? Why don't you come and find out, Miss Bold? She did. She's sparking revival in Arkansas right now. Yeah. Spirit-led evangelism is believing that God put you here for a reason. Asking Him to show you that and then running towards it and having the chutzpah, the courage to act upon it. Where would you be if nobody ever encouraged you in the kingdom? Yeah. Did anybody in here come out of the uterus saved? Just excited? There's a John the Baptist in here. You leaped in the womb during the sixth month. And I mean, since then, other than some lotus and uh, camel's hair, life's been great. The rest of us needed a little help along the way. The rest of the time I have with you today, I'd like to talk to you about how spirit-led evangelism is, evangelism is really deed-based evangelism. When you meet somebody and it's a moment, like the Australian in the elevator, you know. Uh, come here, Dick. 
Have you kept God's commandments? Well, I've tried to be a pretty good person. So then, you admit you've broken at least one of God's commandments? Yes. <laughs> then the Bible says you're a lawbreaker and deserving of death. And the only way out is this sales pitch. What? Behind door number two. We have Disney World for you. Not very many people actually get saved like that. Now I'll give you this. What it might do is it might shake him up a little bit. It might make him faint some. And that's okay. I've done lots of it. I've had knives pulled on me, guns put in my chest. I've done as much street evangelism as most people that you know. And Matthew was with me the whole time. I was hiding behind his guitar. <laughs> but most of the time, People's lives really get impacted when you get a chance to go through some of the same suffering together. When you get a chance to be in the same prison together and they've heard you singing hymns when they weren't able to. They've seen something in you that is different than what's in them and that can't happen in a second or at least it rarely does. It happens as you've gotten to know somebody and you relate to them. So we be spirit led about initiating relationships. But then we be diligent about doing the work of God in those relationships. Yeah, we are not salesmen trying to meet a quota. That kind of church is so carnal. Well, how many are you running, Elizabeth? You know, Dave, you're a pastor. How big's your thing? Yeah, that should be funny. It's ridiculous. How about how many genuine God-led spiritual opportunities did you have and are the people growing from it? I mean, what would you say to Jesus? He's a failure by every stretch of the imagination if this is about how big your thing is. Every time he got five or 6,000, he whittled it down to 12 or 72. At the crucifixion, there's one. But did he thoroughly impact some people's lives in such a real and meaningful way that they knew what he would do in every difficult situation and they wanted to imitate it? Yeah, yeah he did. And we sign our checks and date them because of those people's testimony that he did. See, I really don't care what the salesmen have to say. And they're usually selling you health, wellness, prosperity in exchange for fleecing you. The real men of God simply want to see you live like Jesus. Are there any real men of God out here? Do you want to see people live like Jesus? Do you authentically think it is a better way, a holier way, a more full way? Then how can we not tell people? We have to. And I believe that it can be done in a way that is not cheesy like a Christian movie. So, have you surrendered your life to the full-time What? Who talks like that? Can you not just go share your testimony and your words? Does it have to be a theological dissertation? I don't think so. How many words did it take Paul to convince this jailer? God put the jailer in a situation where his death was imminent. Paul spoke a life-saving word. This is what the gospel's about. Of course, Paul had to be willing to be there and not run from the jail cell the moment it was open. I'm convinced Paul was actually happy there. But that's another message. Turn with me to King 17. Are y'all done? Are y'all the 30-minute church that wants to have church in 30 minutes and go home? Yep. Burger King, I'll order at this window. I'll pick up at that window, call myself a king, wear the little hat. We'll be in 1 Kings. I know sometimes when I'm preaching, I, I seem frustrated. Uh, one thing that is frustrating for me at this point, okay, I've preached in a lot of cities in Israel. I've preached in a lot of cities in Mexico. I've preached in a lot of cities in Germany and in India. We support seven missionaries on four continents. And you know where the church is in the worst shape? Right here. Absolutely bar none because we have everything. We have everything. My kids have three gaming systems. Three. I'm kind of ashamed of that, but we have three gaming systems, <coughs> and the talk in my house is about yet one more attachment for one of the gaming systems. At some point, isn't that kind of pathetic? How much entertainment do we need? Why is the gospel not enough? 
In our house every evening, we're reading 10 plus chapters of the Word. That's our entertainment, and it is a blast. I'm, you go read about mandrakes in Genesis. That's the funniest story I've ever seen. <laughs> and the fact that only three of you are laughing means you have not read it in a while. There are all kind of amazing things in the Word of God. But we're so distracted. Then we, we wonder why miracles happen everywhere but here. We're fickle. It's time to man up. It's time to go after the gospel in an intentional way, a self-sacrificing way. That's not whining how much better it was somewhere else at some other time. That's like whining over leeks and onions in Egypt. Let's not look back and think our whole life has failed because we broke an eyelash when we were two. Let's not be a part of the generation that is always blaming but never taking responsibility. Let's move forward with what we have been given. Let's do something. Are you all in First Kings? Yes. yes. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tish. That's good that he's from Tish since he's a Tishbite, isn't it? And Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except in my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kiriath Ravine east of the Jordan. <laughs> you great man of God who has just faced down kings and prophets. You amazing man of God who is going to do so many miracles that all Jewish children want to grow up to be you. Go hide. How many of you would like that word? Oh, Lord, could I please go hide in a hole, have to drink from the same brook every day, and get fed by unclean birds, because we know how much Jews love unclean things, don't we, Mom? Yeah? Might as well head it right in on the back of pigs. <coughs> I mean... Think about that. Do you think that his heart just leapt inside him with joy? See, we're only obedient to the Lord if he proves to us ahead of time that it will be better for us. That's not obedience. Michael, I want you to eat chocolate ice cream. How much obedience does that take? It's not the same as Michael. Eat some cauliflower. Obedience is not tested when you're only being told what you want to do. Our job is not to reason out the will of God. It's to say yes before we know what He has told us to do because He's God and we're not. That's what lordship is. We've watered this thing down to where we can throw out ten fleeces, we can debate it, we can stand around and talk about what God would and wouldn't do, and then if we still feel like it would be a reasonably good decision for us and benefit our family in a positive direction, then we'll do it. That is not the gospel. If you've had long conversations with people about the permissive will of God and the perfect will of God, you're both silly. There's one will of God. We need to get in it. See, but these are the things that dominate the American landscape. We read about a rich young ruler who gave away everything, and the first question we ask is, do we have to? Instead of, you mean I could do that, and it would be okay? You know, faithless, faithless. I know you don't build a big church like that. I probably will not have to borrow the compact center from anyone preaching like that. But imagine if you took the word seriously. We're in kind of a compacted center, aren't we? <laughs> then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here and turn eastward and hide in the Kiriath Ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook. I have ordered the ravens to feed you where? There. There. This is why in our church, when we turn to a scripture, you're supposed to respond to there. When we are where God tells us to be, whether we like it or don't like it, whether or not it seems wise or advisable, we're in the place called there. And that's where provision comes from. That's where vision comes from. When you're in the place called there is the place of miracles. How could you not love that? You might not like the idea of going, but if you commit your whole heart to it once you're there, instead of half of a heart to it, then we begin to see God in everything. You know, the Bible says to the pure, all things are pure. Yeah? That the glory of God covers the earth. The Bible says that. Isaiah said it. The glory of the Lord covers the earth. 
It took a minor prophet to say the knowledge of the glory of God will cover the earth as water covers the seas. But Isaiah said his glory is already all over the earth. We don't see it because we have our own plans for our lives, our own ideas. Your life doesn't belong to you. And as long as it belongs to you, you're not very useful to Him. We want to be minimally obedient and maximally blessed. If we're honest, that's what our doctrinal statement should say. Let me do the minimum and receive the maximum. Well, how does that work if you're in the underground church in China and they're breaking your toes and fingers every time you're caught? If you've done 20 years for seeing somebody baptized, how would that work? How would you feel about the guy sitting next to you that never got off of his salvation? That never really did anything for the Lord except claim more blessings? Would that feel like a brother to you? What do you think the millennial reign will be like then? A thousand years of serving next to somebody. Yeah. What will the eternal kingdom of heaven be like? An eternity of serving next to somebody. <coughs> Have you ever wondered how you're going to be if you're compared with the Indian Christian? His house was burned for the gospel, legs were broken, but he kept going back until he saw his whole village saved. How about Anna, our missionary there, who in the space of four years has started 20 churches? Is it because he has more resources than us? Is it because his Bible's bigger than ours? What could it be? Then maybe his desire is bigger than ours. Maybe his commitment to obedience is bigger than ours. A man hit Anna right in the face and he said, it's okay, I can take it. <laughs> I thought that was funny. It seemed kind of macho until I realized what he was saying. He said, but every time you hit me is another week I will spend in your village. How about that? They got saved. I've been to Pastor Joshua's house, so you might. Wasn't the music amazing? Of course, Joshua was building a church and a rainstorm washed it away. While he was rebuilding it, a snake bit him on the hand, but he shook it off and kept building. See, the gospel is real in places the people are really in the gospel. Are y'all in 1 Kings 17? Yes. I'm going to get back there. <laughs> Verse 5. So he did what the Lord had told him, and he went to the Kiriath Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Are you kidding me, Lord? You take me to a place, you tell me you're going to feed me by the brook, and then you let the brook dry up from no rain, and why was there no rain? Because Elisha prophesied there would be no rain. Are you sometimes eating the fruit of your own work? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, I just told him what you told me to say, and now he doesn't like me. Sorry. <laughs> and like Jesus either. He prophesied that there would be no rain. Now he's suffering because there's no rain. Could he get a bad attitude over that? Of course he could. It's training, though. He's beginning to learn something. The same thing our church is learning all of the time. His provision never came from the brook. Where did his provision come from? From God who made that brook. And the same God that made that brook can make a hundred other brooks. In fact, he can rain down provision from the sky if the little ravens carrying sandwiches weren't enough. <laughs> what would be more unlikely than that? Well, how about if you're a Jew hated by the Gentile nations and you didn't much care for the Gentile nations either? And then you're told there's a widow in one of those nations that hates you and she's broke beyond belief. In fact, she wants to die. She's so broke. And she's got a son who she thinks is going to die also because she can't feed him. Uh, I want you to go to that enemy nation, to the lowest member of society, who is starving with a dependent already and starving. And you know what? Go say, hey, sweetheart, would you provide for me? Mm -hmm. How many of you are hopping on that bus right now? <laughs> but Elijah did it. He did it. He didn't stand in debate with the Lord. Maybe he kind of saw her a little bit like Paul saw that Macedonian. Maybe he thought, if the Lord is sending me out of Israel all the way to this widow's house, maybe there is a reason he wants me in that widow's house. 
Am I the only one that does not really believe in coincidence? Or have y'all just bought into the idea stuff happens? I don't believe it does. Acts 17, 26 says that he would determine the times and places men would live and work so that we would reach out and find him, though he's not far from us. And to put a little icing on the cake, Paul quotes two, two Greek philosophers in the same passage. Almost as if to say, see, men were reaching out for him, even in these cultures. But I'm here to proclaim to you what you don't already know. What you're striving for, but you don't know. I think God is not a God of coincidence, but miraculous. You know? It's one thing that David and I are close friends, right? He's my brother. You know? Uh, when I married Jennifer, I, I, uh, he became part of my family. I became part of his. But what kind of strange coincidence makes me friends with Michael Hutchinson? Right? When I met Michael, Michael was living in another state, going to another church. No long conversations about it. Missions trip with him. had a similar heart. His son got really touched on a missions trip. I don't think I talked to Michael again. You know? I didn't know what he did for a living. I don't think I'd ever met Jennifer. Didn't know much about them at all. And today, we would die for each other. Do you think that's a coincidence that God does that? I don't at all. And of all the places that he could go, all the places God could plant his family, why do you think God planted him right here? Is it possibly because he has something you need and you have something he needs? I think God does that. Of all the jujitsu gyms we could have walked into, Renan, why do we walk into yours? Because there's a God who orders our footsteps and he cares. Yeah. Of all the fabric stores that Larissa could have worked in, Lisa, how'd she end up in yours? Now, I have no idea who Cody was before he got off a bus from Florida. None. Think about that. Stephen Darnell got here from Chicago. That's a long ways from here. First night I met him, their dog bit me right in the face. Uh, could have walked into a lot of dance studios, Mike, other than yours and Sharon's. But one of our kids walked in, one of our little girls wanted a ballet lesson. God has ordered our footsteps because he wants something from our lives. Yeah? God is sending him because he wants something out of this encounter. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a strange thing that we have to teach this, but it's essential to the gospel. You are not saved just to be saved. It's just like saying you're not healed just to be healed for the sake of healing. He says, pick up your mat and walk. <laughs> he saved you because he has something for you to do. When people are honest with this strange conception of heaven everybody has that is some kind of off-world existence where, you know, it's like some other planet or something with harps and babies with wings and, I don't know, whatever some homosexual artist in the 14th century painted. We have these, if when they're honest, you have this strange question. What would we do forever? Yeah. And then you usually get some weird answer like, well, it will be so glorious we won't even consider what we'll do forever. Man, if God made you to not care what you're going to do forever, or you'll get this, we'll worship forever, to which all the guitar players go, but my fingers. <laughs> the kingdom of heaven is coming this way. Jesus prayed that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That does not happen in its fullest sense till Jesus returns. But we are to be doing the work of kingdom so that we meet his work. And then it is being set up all over the earth. To die now is to be in his presence. But to be alive when he comes is to see the kingdom envelop the earth. And you will have work to do. There will be real things. You might, JJ, get to go all over what parish we live in, Fort Bend. We're not in parishes. I'm not in Louisiana anymore. Fort Bend County and cause people to beat plowshare or swords into plowshares. We might, there's no talent. But one thing I know is if we don't work now, there'll be no part for us in that kingdom. You'll be outside of it where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's a little different than the gospel message we normally hear, huh? Who doesn't want to just die and go to Disney World? What's the point of living if that's the case? There would be no point in it. The point is, is that there's a real, literal kingdom. 
and a real king. And he has a law and a rule and people. And we're to obey him. And what we do now is extended throughout eternity in bodies that will never die. You want to go back to the widow of Zarephath? Yes. I know your butt clock passed 12, and now it's very hard to, to concentrate. Shake it off. We, I mean, it's, it's worth it, right? Huh? Anybody see Avatar in here? There's two of you that saw the movie Avatar. Okay, how about uh, Titanic? After you weren't born, I know. <laughs> I say all of that to prove you can sit still for more than an hour. It can be done. You just have to be motivated. And you don't even got to be still in here. You can stand up, walk around. You can even speak to me. I, I actually am a strange pastor that likes it. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you food. You know what is great about God saying something like that? He does this with the land of Canaan. He does it all of the time. He says, hey man, I've given you the land of Canaan. Now go fight for it. He says here, I have commanded the widow to feed you. You know who, who hadn't heard this yet? The widow. At least not in any way that the Bible tells us about. Maybe she had a dream that's not mentioned, but it seems to me that in this next few lines, Elijah's going to tell him. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, by the way, how did he know? Well, it doesn't say that Charlton Heston spoke to him from the sky. It doesn't say he had a dream. It doesn't say he had a vision. Is it unreasonable to expect that if the Lord told you to go to a certain town and you'll find a widow and you walk into the town and see a widow, that that might be the one? Why? Was she the only widow there? <laughs> Do you see how we outreason God, though? You're in the mall, right? You believe that the Lord sent you there for a purpose. You see somebody, your eyes meet, you seem to have a connection, but what do you do? You're like, oh, there's a lot of people in the mall, Lord. I mean, is that the one? And you talk about it until they've gone on by. They say, oh, well, Lord, if there's really somebody you want me to talk to, then I'll run into them again. Because the city's only got six million people. God should have to do two miracles to get you to be obedient to the first word, huh? When he got there, he saw a widow. So you know what? He walked up to her to talk. Wait a minute, wouldn't it be wonderful if we did the things the Lord told us to do? He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? There's a conversation opener, huh? Hey, widow, you don't have enough to do. Uh, would like to put you to work for me, whom you don't know. As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me a piece of bread. <laughs> you know, hey, honey, do you mind cutting the grass? And while you're at it, would you repave the driveway? You know? I mean, is this audacious as all get out? He's a foreigner. She's a widow. You know, I mean, of all the people that it would hurt your pride to have to be supported by, this has got to be the top of the list, wouldn't it? As surely as the Lord, who's God? The Lord, your God. As surely as the Lord, your God, lives. Now, when people talk in those terms, and they say, well, your God, what does that tell you? There's no real relationship here, is there? She's not intimate with the God of Israel. After all, she's from Zarephath. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour and a jar and a little oil and a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. There's an optimist, huh? Just going home to die. But Elijah was sent there. And why was he told he was sent there? Come on, Bible scholars. What did the Lord say? I've commanded a widow there to feed you. So you could say, well, I'm just going there because she's supposed to feed me. And yet he senses something more in the opportunity. See, sometimes we think we're going somewhere just because, I don't know, Matthew, it's a, it's a job. I'm going to go work at Kenmore Electric because it's a job. Or maybe at uh, Joanne's Fabric, Lisa, because it was a job. See, we think that we've sent somewhere just because it's provision. But if there are people all around you that are just collecting their little sticks so they can go home and die, could you have been sent there for more than just provision? See, there's opportunity all around us. We don't have a lack of opportunity to work. We have a lack of willingness to work. 
we never say that because we don't want to make ourselves guilty. We just say, I don't know what to do. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm praying about it. I need vision for my life. Well, how about you pick one and start? Let him adjust you as you're moving. I don't have a truck anymore, but when I did, it was sitting out there that Wednesday it was stolen. It probably couldn't turn the wheels while it was sitting still. That truck, Matt's truck, Matt still has a truck sitting out there. <laughs> if you get in his truck, it's a one-ton Ford. You can't hardly turn the wheels without turning it on and getting it moving. Once it's moving, it's easy to steer. It's beautiful. But sitting still, it is terrible. Christians are so much the same way. If we could get you moving in some direction, the Lord will steer you right into the vein He wants you. But as long as we sit frozen and we don't have pews for a reason, but you know what I mean? It's tough to get us to do anything. It's that bystander effect we talked about. Everybody's waiting for somebody else to do it, and as long as none of us do it, then we all feel perfectly justified. This is why I'm trying to take the whole church to Mexico. And maybe you can't go. It's okay. I understand. But, you know, some 30 people said, I want to go. And for the last six weeks, every week, four or five people walk up and say, you know, I, I can't go. We're down to, you know, I guess it would be Matt and I. Uh, amen. Praise God for that. You know, the devil has a way of opposing us. And we are so quick to back down. You know, uh, I was in Mexico three days after my father died. You know why? I love the people there. They have a need. I, I thought the best way to get my eyes off of my problems was to go to work for them. You know? uh, no matter what happens, I will be in India this year, and Germany, and probably Sri Lanka, and probably a lot. No matter what happens, as long as our commitments are temporary to the kingdom, I mean, they've got like seven or eight conditions, if this happens, and if this happens, and if this happens, Let's get over ourselves, huh? Our obedience can't be conditional. It comes down to one thing. Either you're called to do something or you're not called to do it. And if you are, it doesn't much matter whether it rains, whether your mom or dad doesn't like it, whether you do or don't have money. Y'all remember when I went to Mexico with steel tires, steel belts showing through the tires? Not enough money, all of those things. We've had more people on that trip than we ever have. It's like God was saying, here, stupid, I can do it without you if you just be obedient. He didn't need anything. People from churches I never had anything to do with sent us money, and I didn't ask. How weird is that? Some of them we've never seen again. This is about more than just provision. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have anything. Down to verse 13. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. Isn't that a mouthful? Look. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go home, JJ. I'm going to get some cookie dough and, and, and some, some milk, and I'm going to eat it, and I'm going to die. And JJ looks and says, go home and do as you have said. <laughs> I mean, if you don't have a next verse, that's pretty tragic, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, the prophet of God shows up and says, Mike, you're planning to die? What you do, do quickly, you know? Uh, but there's a next verse. And what was the next verse? It's an amazing thing. It starts with a word. Somebody call it out. What is it? But, I'm trying to find the verse. But, first, make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. You can plan to go home and die if you want. But, if you will, first, what comes after that are kingdom instructions. And it doesn't matter what they are. When we seek first the kingdom, everything else is added to us. He said, go home and do as you have said, but first. In other words, I'm going to teach you a secret. The secret here is when the Lord becomes your priority rather than your afterthought, it will be okay. Or could we learn that message? You may not be from Zarephath and you may not be a widow here, but are we living a meager existence just to get by? I'm saying when we live to first, do what the Lord has said. And everything else comes after that. You never run out of provision or purpose. Now it's an amazing thing. You know the story. Her jar of flour or oil never goes, goes dry. Her jug never goes dry. God provides for her. You know, and when he provides for her, there's still no calling upon him and calling him Savior. 
Look at verse 17. It gets kind of ugly here. Miraculous provision has not saved her. The hardship of drought and faithfulness of God has not convinced her. But the Lord loved her, and He provided this man to be there in her home. Somebody that could be an example. So verse 17. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? How ugly is that? What has Elijah really done for her? She was going to die the day it mattered. But instead, he provided for her. How? By teaching her to put the Lord first and her flour never ran out. Her oil never ran out. But now she has a tragedy in the home and who does she blame? You ever heard the expression, bite the hand that feeds you? We do it all of the time. God has given you life. He's given you breath. He's given you everything that you have. You don't have anything that He didn't give you. But let something go wrong. And who do we blame? Look what he does. This is where most Christians would just be out of there. Fine, you old hag. <coughs> oh, Christians don't say that? Fine, blessed woman of God, but you think old hag. <laughs> <laughs> Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Just our presence around the lost ought to convict them of sin. She's not talking just about her son death. She's talking about feeling guilty. Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. This may seem so strange to you, but this is not Elijah's house. Who is it? Whose house is it? Widow. Widow. But Steve, when somebody comes and stays in your house and you give them a room, let's just call it a guest room, right? That kind of becomes their room for a little while, doesn't it? I mean, it'd be a little bit weird if Jennifer came to stay with you. She unpacked all of her things. She walked out of the room for a minute and came back in, and you're standing in there going through all of her things. That'd be weird. Everybody say that'd be weird? That'd be weird. No, go ahead and say it. That would be weird? That would be weird. This is not weird. The widow has given him a room in her house. It's the only personal space he has. And where does he take the boy? Right into his personal space. Something happens in the gospel when people are offensive to you. They're ugly to you. They slap your face, so to speak. They accuse you, but you pull them closer rather than push them <coughs> further. See, it's a defense mechanism, Rachel. Sometimes people say something that's a little bit ugly, and they don't mean to be ugly. What they're saying is, I'm scared to death you're going to hurt me. Why don't you stay over there, and I'll stay over here? But something about the nature of the gospel will compel you to move in a little closer to risk being wounded because they're worth it. So he takes this boy into his room. Now this next part is weird. But it's weird in a supernatural, weird, good way. He puts the boy on his bed. He stretches out on him. Not once or twice, but three times. Sometimes for the gospel to advance, we need to be close enough for people for them to hurt us. When that happens, we need to respond by pulling them closer, not pushing them further. And then the life that is in you is meant to rub off on the life that is in them. And it doesn't happen right away. It doesn't happen just your first interaction. It might take persistence like three times. But the boy's life returns to him. And then the woman says the most amazing thing. Now I know that the... Uh, let me read it. Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is true. All the miraculous provision in the world had not convinced her. But one man living in her house, being insulted by her, but loving her anyway, experiencing death and rubbing shoulders right up next to it rather than being scared of it, and seeing the resurrection power of a life truly changed. And now she's convinced. 
American preachers would have you believe that if you have enough money, that if you dress nice enough, that if your life looks like Ken and Barbie, that the lost will see it and they'll want what you have. But reality is it's just an excuse to be carnal and be just like the world. What the gospel tells us is you go where I tell you, when I tell you, and do what I tell you, and the results will be miraculous. You will see jars that never run out. You will see old widows that were overlooked, exalted to be princes with God, and you will see the dead raised. That is the dangerous, bare bones, radical gospel. And you shouldn't have to go to another country to do it. You don't know any offensive people? <laughs> You don't know anybody that has a tendency to push away rather than pull to? Lord, you might even find some in this room. See, that is the gospel. The gospel is that you care enough to hear from God there's a widow somewhere. Then you go and no matter what she does. The gospel is enough that you care about a jailer somewhere. And no matter what he does, you go after him. The gospel is that you care enough about Joseph that you're revived when you see him come to life. Joseph was in Egypt. Jesus was in a solitary place. Paul was in a Macedonian jail. And Elijah was in a drought in Zarephath. But they all bloomed where they were planted. They found a way for it to be God right where they were at. What is our excuse? Every tree will be known by its fruit. Jesus said that. I did. We have a chance to bear fruit. Here comes our very last scripture to the, for the day. Thank you for there being no applause with that. Matthew, come on up here. We'll close with a song. Uh, Y'all turn to 2 Corinthians. What, have I preached y'all into a coma? Are you tired? Uh, Y'all in Corinthians 4? 2 Corinthians 4? <laughs> Nothing happens in the kingdom without sacrifice. Nothing. There is no such thing as I was so blessed and just blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed that those blessings all blessed you. That's not how something works. The kingdoms never work that way. If that was the case, then God would have simply rained down on humanity, blessing after blessing, until we were so blessed that there was nothing left to do. But instead, He killed His Son. He gave Jesus' life for our life. The apostles were so blessed that they all got to give their lives that we might have life. The gospel message always brings death to the person who is giving it and life to the recipient. It requires you to give up your Friday night and get busy with what God is doing. It requires you to give up your new gaming system and do what God is doing. It requires you to change your retirement plans and do what God is doing. Death for you so that there can be life for them and exchange of yours for theirs. This is 2 Corinthians 4, starting in verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. You know, we have turned that into a song, and I get it. I even like the song. But let's not forget that this is a real man's real words. And he was beaten for the gospel, shipwrecked for the gospel, snake bit for the gospel, turned on by his brothers for the gospel, untold suffering so that you would have life. Jesus did all of those things for Paul. Paul turned and then did them for us. And our job is to give ours away so that they might receive. Every person in here is a part of the Great Commission. Every single one. It's war. It requires something to die that something might live. 
It's that axiom, freedom is not free. We're supposed to be engaged in it, not building comfortable lives for ourselves. The, I would much rather that my parents never had to move from their home, that I never had to move from their home. We'd all just build a little nest, eat popcorn, and watch movies all day, every day for an eternity, right? And truthfully, nobody would be happy in that scenario. But somehow or another, the devil convinces you that everything everywhere else is always bad. I'm telling you, we were made for a fight. And there is life in it. And if there is no struggle, if there is no hardship, if there is nothing to overcome, you lose your purpose. Struck down but not destroyed, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that His life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. I want to ask you what you have. Where are your five loaves, your two fishes? Where is your ornamented robe? Where is it that you can give something up that somebody else might live? And I'm not talking about your checkbooks. Where in your life can you do without so that somebody else might get something? For somebody at work that nobody wants to sit next to? For somebody at school everybody stays away from? Is there a favorite movie everybody's going to, but you say, you know, tonight, Lord, I, I'm not going to go watch... Twilight. I want to spend that same time in prayer because I believe you will show me somebody or something I can do for your kingdom. When we live like that, miracles become commonplace. As long as we are solely concerned with what we eat, what we wear, how much we have or don't have, as long as we're out there building bigger barns to store more stuff, of course our lives are devoid and meaningless. Of course they are. How could they be anything else? They're just like the world. I don't want to be just like the world anymore. I don't know how long I've got, but however long it is, I want to exhaust myself for the king. Come on, is there anybody here that shouldn't be able to say that? I don't know how long I've got, but as long as I have left, I want to exhaust myself for the king. When's the last time you got absolutely plum slap tight doing something for Jesus? Just dog wore out if you're from Louisiana. But we'd go do it for something in the world. You'd get up at 3 in the morning, wait in line all night for a new TV set, $100 cheaper than the other one. Yeah. Surely we could do something for Jesus that's courageous, that we could be proud of. Huh? Now stand to your feet.